Good morning. Our sermon text this morning is Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the baptisms that you allowed us to see. We pray for each one that was baptized, and we pray now, Father, that they would not just receive Jesus, but they would walk in Jesus. We pray for those that are pouring into their lives, both in their homes and then as a part of our faith family. Would you grant every grace they need to make sure that they will be discipled now? And Father, would you cause them to grow and to love you and to walk in your ways and to then make disciples of others? Father, thank you for the opportunity to confess our sin in this service, to confess that you reign above all and we reject that, but you have not left us in our rebellion, but you came into the depths of it in sending your son and taking it upon him so that we can confess. And then what we confess that you cleanse and that we can be brought back into right relationship with you, which is the point of the gospel, not that we get heaven, not that we avoid hell, but Father, that we get you. And so Father, we are grateful that we can praise you in this service, that we can sing. Thank you, Father, for John back in front of the choir. Thank you, Father, for in Mitch and his sickness that Benjamin is able to lead us. Father, thank you for this morning to be able to sing truth. And Father, I know that we may not have come in here feeling it this morning. We may have come in here struggling. We may have come in here discouraged. We may have come in here doubting your goodness toward us. But Father, I pray that the facts of the gospel would trump all of our deceiving feelings, that you have demonstrated your love for us in Jesus, and you cannot make it more clear. And I pray, Father, that you would then use those facts to fuel praise and adoration in our lives, that we would become living sacrifices for you, not just when we gather in this room, but to every place that you take us. There would be the aroma of Christ that is on us as, we, as you spread everywhere the fragrance of him, and that, Father, you would use us for your kingdom purposes. Father, I, I pray we, we completed our study of Ruth last week. Would you help us not to forget what we learned? Would you help everything that we learn in your word then impact how we live? These aren't academic studies. These aren't book reviews. Uh, Father, these are the words of life. So would you help them to get into us so that they can flow out of us to others who need them? And as we come now to begin our study of Revelation, would you use your word to fuel faithfulness in us? Would you use your word to show us your greatness, your control, that you sit on the throne and no one and nothing will ever change that? And that as those who surround you will declare your holiness, they will also declare your worthiness as we've just done. And that that chorus will spread further and further from the throne room of heaven eventually to fill heaven and earth to declare your greatness. That Father... There are those yet to sing that, though. And we pray that you would grip our hearts with gospel urgency for those who are still under your wrath rather than under Christ's reign. Father, I pray that you would move even in this room today and allow it to be the day of salvation. And not just our room. Father, would you grant across Gwinnett County 
today for the, for the gospel to be clear and effectual, for people to hear the word of truth and to respond, to move from death to life. Father, I pray that as we, we encounter our study, as always, we're not trying to just be informed so that we can win some eschatological debates. Father, I pray you would use your word that we're never the same, that we're transformed, that we look more like Christ, the one who loves us and freed us from our sin by his blood. He is worthy, for he has made us to be a kingdom and priest to you. So to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, welcome here today. If you are a guest, we're glad that you were with us. We completed our series in Ruth last week. I'm grateful for Nathan being able to do that. Tara and I listened as we were driving back from Tupelo. And I'm grateful that whoever is in the pulpit, one of the things that you can know is uh, the word will always be proclaimed. You don't have to worry about whether it will be a man-centered text or not. And I thought Nathan did a great job. And I'm, I'm grateful for his uh, leading us to the closing of Ruth. Today, we have the opportunity to begin our study in the book of Revelation. And uh, maybe, how, how many of you have ever avoided something because you were afraid of it or you didn't know a lot about it? Have you ever done that? I mean, that's me with countless fruits and vegetables, right? And so... <laughs> Uh, but afterwards, you find out that if you put enough cheese on broccoli, it tastes wonderful, right? Uh, and, and so I feel that some folks have a reservation about the book of Revelation because they're fearful that they don't grasp all the numbers or the symbols or these sorts of things. But I want to say something to you from the very beginning. Just because we do not know all things in Revelation fully does not mean that we cannot know some of the things clearly. That there are some truths that are very clear. Matter of fact, I would submit to you the most important things we need to know are very clear. And as we begin, I want to give you a, a picture. I, I do promise we don't have all our eschatological maps figured out. But we do have a, a graph that I want to show you. A, a couple images here uh, will come on the screen. Uh, and see? Hey, better than our, our baby dedication, right? All right. We got them this time. All right. And so this is just a big chart. We're going to zoom in here in just a moment, but I want you to see just a big picture of the book of Revelation in the very top bar. Uh, what are those three words for the, there it is. You see right there? Things which what? All right. Things which are. And, and then the, uh, across the middle, we'll go on to say things which uh, shall be hereafter. All right. If we'll go back to that, that previous slide, the things that are, the book of Revelation is going to be divided in really two big time epics. The things that are, John is going to be able to see some things that are true in his time and for his period. And then he's going to see some things that are to come. Those are the two big time markers. And so even in the revelation of Jesus, it's not just the revelation of Jesus, but it's the revelation of the things that happen before Jesus returns and the things that will happen after Jesus returns. And as we come to this book, what we'll know is what we are going to study from now, should the Lord give us now until December, we're going to study the first five chapters. You see the numbers there at the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, which is really the introductory material of the book. And then the midsection, the middle chapters, are which you see judgment begin to be poured out. The scroll begins to be opened, the seals, and you get these bowls and trumpets. And then getting all the way to the last verses, which the, the heading of, of it says glory. Uh, if you get to the far right of it, they've got one more slide for you. You see it says glory. Now, what I would say to you to this picture is that's wrong. I would say to you that glory is in every chapter. I would say to you that glory is going to be in every chapter that we encounter in the book of Revelation, but it's, it's just a way that they wanted to categorize it in this, that in, in, verse, in chapters 21 and 22, in particular, when God does come to dwell with us, when we see him face to face, we will certainly grasp his glory in a way that we have never done up until that point. And so one last slide I'll show you if we, if we back up just the bottom half. One of the things that, I, that you'll see uh, is the word songs. You'll see songs in different places through this. You see songs there under four and five. You see songs under chapter seven. You see songs there in, in 13 and 14. And then you see songs over in 1920. Here's what I want to say. If our study of Revelation doesn't produce worship, we're not doing it right. 
of our, of our study of seeing God in his greatness, of seeing Christ in his reign, to seeing God in his control doesn't produce worship and doesn't produce faithfulness and doesn't produce putting away sin, then we're not studying it right then it is just an academic study where we're getting some cool things that we might be able to dominate our friends at 12 Stone and Bible Trivia if we played them, right? But that's not what we want. What we want is that this word impacts us so that it transforms us and worship is all throughout. And, and what I want to say to you is it's not worship that is commanded. It is worship that is compelled. It is worship that just flows out. Matter of fact, in our text, you, you'll see it. Let me just show you right now. As he begins, as John begins to talk about who this letter is from, in verse 5, he says that it's from Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of earth. He then moves and says, well, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sin by his blood and made us kingdom priest to God and his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. I need you to know that's not just uh, formal introductory material. As he was writing about Jesus, he couldn't help but worship Jesus, right? And so if our study of Revelation doesn't just compel praise, then we're not doing it right. Something, something is off here. So let me give you a couple sentence summaries of the book of Revelation. And we're going to study just the first eight verses because they are a great introduction of the whole book today. And I'm going to call you to three specific actions in a moment. But let me give you some introductory sentences about the book of Revelation. One should be in your notes. And if you don't have our notes, let me tell you a couple of ways you can get the notes, either through our app or if you go to our website and go to the Sunday resources under the, the more section, you can get the notes there. And then we often, we print copies for our senior adults, especially uh, that, that are out at the different engagement centers. And so there's several ways that you can get the notes. And I always encourage you to get the notes because if I'm jacked up and forget what I was going to say, you can at least know what I thought I might say, right? And there you go. You got the notes and be able to take those and teach them better to others. But this should be somewhere at the top of your notes, and, and it's the passage in the sentence that we have a word from God the Father to reveal afresh our Christ who's conquered, that we might keep his word no matter our circumstances. So let me say it again, that the, the book of Revelation is a word from God the Father to reveal afresh our Christ who's conquered, that we might keep his words no matter our circumstances. And where will we get this idea of keeping his words? Well, if you look in verse 3, we will come back to this toward the end of our text today, but blessed is, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. That's why I'm doing it. I'm getting my blessing right now. I'm reading it to you. Uh, I remember going to a church and, uh, and that was the, the song they sang, I'm going to get my blessing. I'm going to get my blessing. That's all. It was the repetition of just that. And I was like, well, how do I get it? You're thinking about how do I get it, right? No one, uh, no one mentions the blessing. It, I, I assure you the next line wasn't through being faithful through persecution. I promise you. But that is a means to doing it. Here's one. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. So from the very beginning, it matters what we're doing with these words that we've been given. Hold your place in Revelation 1 and go to Revelation 22, which we will be in in the year 2022. All right, turn to Revelation 22. And what you find is in verse six, it says, and he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And then I'll, I'll show you while we're here that these words, they're, they're not to be sealed up. Look at verse 10 there in, in Revelation 22. He said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. So you have these bookends in Revelation and you, you have a, 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 some bookends in, in our text today. The one who is and was and is to come bookends our verses today. But in the book of Revelation, Revelation itself is says, hey, here are the words that God has given. Keep them, read them, hear them, but keep them, meaning hold on to them, memorize them, obey them, walk in them is this idea of keeping them. So the beginning of the book and the end of the book remind you that you're not supposed to just highlight and underline things and then that's it, but that we're supposed to be doing something with these words. So let me ask you, church, what are you doing with the words of God? 
What are you doing with the words of Christ? We know what's coming because he's given it and they were never meant to be sealed up. You should not encounter revelation in here on Sunday and then be silent about it on Monday at work. Students, you should not encounter revelation in here on Sunday for the next several weeks and then be silent about it when you go to school because we know what is and we know what is coming, right? And so we know who is and who reigns and who's in control. And the last thing that we should do is to be silent. When God gave a vision to Daniel, he said to close those words up because it wasn't time. But as you come to the book of Revelation, he says, time is near. Those are the other time markers you're going to see. He says at the end of verse 3 in our text, back in Revelation 1, that, that time is near. And then in Revelation 22, behold, I'm coming soon. There's this urgency that should grip us with God's words that we would be keeping them with urgency and we would be going forward with them with urgency. So we have a word from God the Father to reveal afresh our Christ who's conquered that we might keep his words no matter our circumstances. But I told you I wanted to give you a couple more summary sentences. And so here's another one. God has provided revelation, and I do want to be clear, it's not revelations, So, but don't be that person in connect group, right? If someone says, you know, in our study of revelations, don't be the, whoa, 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 don't do that, all right? <laughs> Just be like, <coughs> Sean, Sean. just cough it out, right? And so be kinder to it. Because it's, it's one unveiling. It's one, one truth that God wants us to have here. God has provided revelation for the purpose of our hopeful and joyful perseverance and praise. Even if necessary, we have to face persecution. So he's given us revelation to fuel our hopeful and joyful Perseverance. All right, repeat after me. He's given us revelation for hopeful. Man, that sounded like it. Let's try that again. For hopeful and joyful perseverance and praise, even in persecution. I know which part you're hoping not to have, right? You're all for the perseverance and praise, the persecution. Right, And so he has provided revelation to fuel our hopeful and joyful perseverance and praise all the way through it, even if we must face persecution. And then one more sentence summary I want to give you. God has given revelation not to fuel fascination or fear. And with those words, what I mean is the numbers and symbols and the dragon and all the things that you'll see in the book of Revelation. There are some people who get so fascinated with the symbols that they miss the things that are clearly said about Jesus, right? And we can become so fascinated with the often the broccoli stuff that we miss the main things. And so God has not given us revelation to fuel our fascination or even our fear he has given us revelation to fuel our faithfulness, that we would know the God who reigns, the God who is bringing all things to his appointed end of them. And so the last thing we have to be is afraid. And the last thing we want to be is fascinated with things that are, that are side marks in here rather than the main truths that he, he gives us. So with these summary statements that we have a word from God the Father to reveal afresh our Christ who's conquered, that we might keep his words no matter our circumstances, and that he's given these words for our hopeful and joyful perseverance and praise, even in the midst of persecution, but not to fuel fascination and fear, but faithfulness all the way through. This is what we have. Now, let me read these words to you from another minister. Here's what he wrote. Suppose persecution were to come to the church in America. Well, why am I focusing on? Why do I keep saying persecution? Because Domitian was the ruler at the time that John most likely wrote this in the 90s AD, and he was not a good guy. The things that he did to his very family members uh, would cause you to cringe. And he's the one in charge of a majority of the world at that point. At least he thinks he is, right? At least he thinks he is. And, and so as, as Revelation is written, you're going to see here that it's written to churches who are experiencing persecution. Matter of fact, John is on the Isle of Patmos because he's been faithful to witness of Jesus. He has been faithful to the words and the way that the, the world rewarded him is to exile him and to persecute him. Here's what this minister wrote. Suppose persecution was to come to the church in America as it's come in other countries. The immunity to persecution that Christians in our country have experienced in the past two or three centuries is unusual. 
Christ strongly warned Christians that to follow him would not be popular and that in most circumstances it would mean cross-bearing and persecution. The Bible says that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus said at the time of his return, as it draws close, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you. So he writes and says, we have no scriptural foundation for believing that we can forever escape being persecuted for Christ's sake. I would submit to you that if you make it all the way through this life without ever being persecuted for Christ, you may have made it all through this life without actually ever following Christ. Because the ones who will follow Christ, Paul writes to Timothy, they will be persecuted. Why? Because the world hated Christ. It will hate the one who looks like Christ. But if you're making it through scot-free, then it may be because the world can't see Jesus in you. Maybe they just see themselves, right? But there's this idea of, man, I'd, I'd love to just have it uh, persecution-free. He goes on to write to say, the normal condition for Christians is that we should suffer persecution. And then he asks, are you willing to face persecution and death for Christ's sake? And so then he goes on, since we've experienced little religious persecution in this country, it is likely that under pressure, many would deny Christ. Those who shout the loudest about their faith may surrender soonest. Many who boast of being courageous will be cowardly. Many who say, though all others deny Christ, yet I will never deny him, will be the first to warm their hands at the campfires of the enemy. Jesus, in speaking of the last times, warned, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. The scripture says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The Apostle Paul, referring to the coming evil day, said, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. And that's why we have the book of Revelation, to be able to stand. You know who wrote all those words? Billy Graham in 1957. Billy Graham in 1957, before his crusades in New York, this is what he wrote about. And certainly, as we see things ramping up, the question is, will we stand? Will we stand? Will we be faithful? That's why he's writing this book to his churches so that they will stand and be faithful. And so again, revelation is provided for our hopeful and joyful perseverance and praise, even if we have to face persecution. I guess the other way to say it is revelation, in revelation, God provides perspective that we need to finish well. He provides the perspective we need to, to finish well. Now, when you've encountered people who are suffering, what have, you, what have you offered them? Perhaps let go and let God, because that always ministers so deep to me. Uh, I always appreciate where my heart has been absolutely gut-wrenched that you, you would come with your Christian Lifeway slogans. Thank you. Let go and let God, brother. It's going to be all right. Oh, I feel so blessed right now. Thank you for your accumulated wisdom. I appreciate that, right? Maybe you'd offer practical insights. Well, here's how you could stand brother, brother, step one, step two. Here's how you could grieve better, right? Uh, here's some practical remedies. I love that, that when God wants to encourage people who are suffering, he doesn't give them trite phrases. He doesn't just give them practical steps. He just gives them a greater vision of himself. He shows them his greatness and his glory. How many of you need to see that today? How many of you need to see God's greatness because your own greatness tends to be a competitor every day, right? You want to live for your own greatness. I have to have my heart recalibrated every Sunday, every Wednesday when we gather, and every day in between all of those because I will want to live for my own renown or my own greatness. And yet I have to see God and God alone is great. And he is in control. And so this fuels. And the reason is so that we won't be tempted to compromise, right? That we won't be tempted to... Uh, how many of you have ever gone to discipline your children and they tried to work out a bargain with you, Right? And so what, what we don't want to do is be tempted to compromise and soften the persecution. If the persecution rages, then in the spirit of Christ, may we stand and be faithful. May we not sell out for the flesh to avoid pain in the flesh. May we not sell out, but may we be faithful. So the beginning of this says the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation uh, comes from our, this idea of apocalyptic, but it means an unveiling, an unveiling. Uh, if the, and what we mean by that is, is to take away the cover so that one can see something more clearly. So imagine a bride walking down the center aisle with a veil on her face. The groom can, can see her face a little bit through the veil, right? Through the mosquito net, right? But then 
uh, when, when the father, whoever is giving her away, lifts it, he can see her face even more clearly. And this is, this is what the book of Revelation is. It is an unveiling. Now, the question is, what is it an unveiling of? And it is an unveiling of God's sovereignty and his reign and his control and the one who is worthy to carry all of these things out. Matter of fact, you sung about him just a few moments ago, the one who's worthy to, to carry these things out. And so we're going to see that the Father has revealed this, the Son has relayed it to us, and that we're to respond. That's the order of things. The Father has revealed it, the Son has relayed it to us, and that we should respond. And so it's not just a word on how it will all end, but what we should be doing while we wait. And, and let me go ahead and, and say this. People want to know, hey, are we in, in the last days? I had a conversation yesterday, even with a couple, you know, that we want to, are these the last days? From the category of uh, salvation, we are in the last days. The author of Hebrews has already told us that, that in these last days, that God has spoken clearest to us through his son. But again, we always want to know, but are these the last, last days? I mean, are these the ones that everyone's been, all my charts growing up and all my hanky hankies, you know, and all my, all my stuff, are these the last, last days? Here's what you need to know. These are our only days. These are our only days. And so the book of Revelation it gives us comfort in what's to come, but it also tells us here's what we do now while we have life, while we have breath, while we have opportunity. You do not have an opportunity to share the gospel in heaven. It won't be needed that we will celebrate that, but your opportunity to share the gospel is now with people who still are outside of that, who, who need to hear the word of Christ. And so I want to call you to three specific actions, and it's, it's not necessarily me, it's our text today in these eight verses. And the first action that I want to call you to is to rejoice in our Father who reveals, to rejoice in our Father who reveals. And I want to show you a couple things about God the Father in this text. First of all, I want to show you his communication and the very first words of verse one, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants. So where did this revelation come from? It has come from God. It has come from God the Father and it was given to the Son. In his communication, I want you to think about God's initiation. I think sometimes we take for granted that we have the book of Revelation. But I do want to say to you that there is a lot we could still know about heaven from Isaiah, from what Jesus has taught us in Matthew, from things that Paul has written in his epistles. So it's not to say that, they, that we couldn't know some things, but we know a whole lot more because we have Revelation and the reason we have revelation is not because a committee got together and said, Father, I think you should write a tome on this, right? It wasn't because someone beat God in a thumb wrestling contest and forced this. We have revelation because of his own initiation. God wants us to know the most important things. He doesn't want us to be in the dark about what matters most. Now, has he revealed all things? No, but he's revealed all we need for now. What he has revealed is sufficient. And so I hope that, that you will rejoice. Now, in his initiation, he did it again in 90s AD. How many of you have found that when God ministers to you, you know, he knows exactly when to say what? All right. And this is what he does. So and so while those churches in Asia were suffering, he sends this word through John. And it's a unique word. It is apocalyptic, meaning these these in things, these last things, this unveiling. But there's also elements of prophecy in this book. There's also elements of being an epistle or a letter that are in this book. The question I often ask is, when is this word for? Who, who, who gets this word? And there's some who think that everything that we'll see in Revelation has already been settled when John wrote this, that when the temple fell in 70 AD, that these things have already been carried out. That's one lens of it. There are others who would say that Revelation has been unveiling through the history of the church and different movements, and, and God's been sort of unrolling these scrolls all along. And there are others who, who would say, no, many of the things that we're going to see are still to come. They have not yet occurred in here. What I don't want you to be confused is to say, well, this is, if you'll look in verse 4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, well, this is just to them. This is, this is what they needed. This is no more just for them than Ephesians was just for the church at Ephesus and not for us. 
The Galatians was for the church at Galatia, not for us. The Corinthians was for the church at Corinth and not for us. In the same way that all of those were for us and every generation since, so is the book of Revelation. So it comes from God. What I want you to see is it comes through Christ. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. The reason that we have this is it comes through Jesus. Why would that be? It is because every blessing comes through Jesus. And this is a blessing. You see in verse 3, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear, and blessed is the one who keeps what's written in it. So these blessings come to us through Jesus. And so that, let me just give you a quick reminder. There are no blessings to be found outside of Jesus. You and I may try to pursue it week in and week out, but there are no blessings to be found outside of Jesus. This blessing comes through Jesus. Let me tell you the other reason that this blessing comes through Jesus, and it's because you sang about it. Because Jesus is going to be the one in Revelation 5 who is worthy to take the scroll. Well, who wrote that scroll? God the Father wrote that scroll. God the Father has ordained all the things that are to be. And there is only one who is worthy to open that scroll and to carry those things out and to reveal all that's in those. And so the reason that the message comes through him is because all of God's blessings to us come only through Jesus. And because Jesus is the only one worthy to carry all of those things out, right? So it comes to us through Jesus. Now, here's why this is really, really important today. Because we have in our world this idea that all denominations are the same. Or worse, that all religions are the same. Are all religions the same church? And, and we have to know why are we confident that not all religions are the same? Let me submit one to you. Uh, the reason that I would hold to Christianity is uh, because our king is alive. He took death and crushed it, and he reigns even now. And I don't know any other person who started a religion or a movement uh, that death didn't swallow up, right? And so Christ has crushed death. And so this is why you need to pay attention. Uh, these words that we will handle as we do this study, they're not just advice, right? It's not like good housekeeping. Do they still make that? It's not like we, we signed up for the Boy Scouts this week because we have free time, apparently. And... and <laughs> It's, uh, it's not like uh, the little scouting life book, look, right? Here's what you need to see. These are words that come from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. These are, aren't words just to be considered. These are words to be carried out and obeyed. All right? So they come from Father and they come through Jesus to us. That's his communication. I want to see you, show you quickly here his care, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants, that God intended this word for his church. And, and you'll see the same thing in Revelation 22. So that he's given this word for his servants and that it's intended for our comfort, not our confusion. There's so many times we've, we've read this and people have become more uh, divisive about it. God gave this word for our comfort. It was meant to be a congregational letter. And one of the ways that you even see that comfort, look in verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn dead, and the ruler of the kings of earth. The very thing that he says initially to churches that are suffering is grace and peace from the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. I hope that we never get to the point that you and I would be de desensitized, that grace and peace would be extended from the Trinity to us. That grace and peace would be what they desire to give us for our comfort, for our hope, that grace and peace is coming from the Father, from the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus, to which is why he then responds, well, then glory and praise be back to them. If grace and peace are flowing from them, then glory and praise should flow back to them. The other thing that I want to show you is not just his care, but, but God's certainty. This is revelation, not speculation. God is not guessing here. God is not hoping. God is ordaining and accomplishing. That's what the book of Revelation is. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a, this would be nice if it worked out this way. Go back to verse one, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. Well, who is determining what is required to take place? God. And so the certainty of what we'll see, when we come to the end of the revelation, friend, you may want it to be another way. I don't know why you would, but it will not be any other way than what is revealed right here. 
God is writing to us what is going to take place, and God is certain because he's not guessing. William Mounts, one of the commentators in, in the Revelation series, he writes and says, history is not a haphazard sequence of unrelated events, but a divinely decreed ordering of that which must take place. But I want to say a word about that in light of our Ruth study. We talked about how it's providence, not coincidence. Providence, not coincidence. And I want to take just one moment here, thinking through that Ruth study. Again, the bigger deal is not that, it, as God is ordaining these things to take place, it's not that we're robots. And, and aren't making any real choices. The bigger deal is that God's sovereignty is over the real choices we're making every day and he's working these things out, right? That, that as you and I go about and we, we do this or we don't do that or we make the decision. This is the third shirt I put on this morning, by the way. And I didn't feel any compelling in my closet with God forcing which way we should go, right? I even tried some jackets, but you know, we've all seen when the sweat flows up here, haven't we? We've seen that. We'll wait for the colder months to give a good run and start at that. But, but here, that I, uh, is, is God then uh, ordaining each of these shirts and, and for this part? What I want you to see is the bigger deal about God's sovereignty is that even as you and I make real choices, he's still directing our paths. That's the amazing thing. We're not robots. We're real people. And he's accomplishing his plans. And his plans are certain. Two more things I just want to show you about God. One is his consistency. Look at how John describes him there in verse 4. He is the one who is and who was and who is to come. And just in case we're slow learners, he says in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. There's a, there's a repetition there, and you see this consistency. And, and in essence, this is the picking up from Exodus of I am. I am, right? This is, the, this is the identifying of him. But it is also the consistency, and this is such a good word, because we live in a day where some, sometimes people are kind, then they're not kind. Then they're faithful, then they're not faithful. They're good, then they're not good. God is always consistent. He is always holy. He is always faithful. He is the one who is, who was, and is to come. God will never cease to be to you who he has always been because he cannot. He cannot cease to be God. He cannot cease to be holy. He cannot cease to be loving. He cannot cease to be just, and he never will. He will never disappoint you in shifting his personality, right? The last thing that I want to point out to you is from God is that it's his control. It's there in verse 8. He is the Alpha and the Omega, uh, he knows what he's doing because he is the first word and he is the last word. He is the first word that was spoken into man's history. He will be the last word that is spoken into man's history. And we should know this from Romans 11, for from him and through him and to him are all things. That's why he is the alpha and the omega, that before the mountains were brought forth or ever you formed the earth and the sea from everlasting to everlasting, you were God. So before there was anything else, there was God. He is first and he will be last. And then as a, a part of this, he is the almighty. He ends our, our section today, verse eight, with the one who is and who was and who is to come, the almighty, which means God doesn't just want to accomplish some things, but lacks the power to do it. God has all the power he needs to accomplish all that he desires. He is the one who is in control. He is the almighty one. And you need to understand that God and the devil are not 50-50. Sometimes there's this uh, thought of yin and yang and light and dark. No, no, no. God has no equal. God reigns over all. And so he, and he alone is in control. When we get to Revelation 4 in a few weeks, there is one who is seated on the throne and it is God. He is in control of all things. And we will come back to this idea of Alpha and Omega at the very end today. I want you to consider some things. The bottom line is, how many of you love getting a letter from somebody? My kids love getting letters. When Adelaide was at camp this summer, I, we, we made sure to write, to write, to write. I remember as a child, my, my great aunts and grandmothers made sure that I got the most letters at the camp, Dry Creek Baptist Camp, when I was a little kid. I can remember that. My dad, as crazy and difficult as he was, would write letters. Now, those letters were crazy. He would talk about, just, hey, I got the oil changed at 1038 this morning. And then 1140, I put air in the tire. You know, I mean, I was, what a blessing, Dad. Thanks. Thanks for, thank you that I could just receive your journal, you know. And, uh, but inevitably, he would say something, hey, hope you're well, and here's $10. And so I can remember when Dad died, 
Um, the next days I waited because I was hoping there was at least one more letter that he sent, right? And I remember just that no other letter came and, and grieving of that, grieving the sadness of that, especially after my dad became a Christian and, and the letter shifted, right? And they weren't there. Hey, here's the good news about Revelation. It is a letter from your loving and kind father for you. It is a letter so his children don't have to be afraid. It is a letter to know no matter how dark it seems, light will push back all the dark. No matter how difficult things are be, matter of fact, to one church, you'll say, be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. Because no matter how much Domitian thinks he's in control, Domitian does not sit on my throne. And it's a word of hope that we would persevere. So uh, we should rejoice in a father who reveals. How many of you are grateful that the father's given us revelation? How many of you know he didn't have to do it, but he lovingly has chosen to do this? So let us accept these words as our father lovingly choosing to comfort his children, to say, keep running, keep running. Here's what's coming. Now, with that in mind, what he does in the middle of it is he offers a reminder of our Christ who reigns. One of the things that you're going to see through the whole book of Revelation is that Jesus has no equal. There's no armies that are going to conquer him. I hate to do the spoiler alert, but in Revelation 19, when he rides that white horse, he doesn't even have to get off the horse to accomplish the victory, right? And that every battle you see in Revelation, I don't even know how Tim LaHaye wrote books about uh, Armageddon because it's just a moment. It's a moment and they're consumed and we move on because Christ reigns, right? And then here's the deal. We need to consider Christ. The author of Hebrews has tried to help us to say, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you don't grow faint hearted and weary, Right? Some, one of the reasons why we're tempted to stop running for Jesus is because we have taken our eyes off of Jesus. When we put our eyes on Jesus, we're reminded no one has endured more sinful opposition than Jesus has. And we look to him so that we will keep running. We look to him so that we will keep running. And here, the whole book of Revelation provides a reason to look to Jesus and to keep running, to keep persevering. But in particular, these first eight verses... There are some things that I want to show you because it's not just about future revelation. It is also about present reality. These things even now are true of our Jesus. And so, first of all, it is the, the revelation of him and he is the faithful witness. So grace and peace to you in verse four from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits, that's the Holy Spirit who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. And now he describes him in three specific ways here. The faithful witness, the firstborn the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. He is the faithful witness because no one has ever spoken as clearly about God the Father than Jesus has. He is the one who has spoken truly. And the word witness, we can even get our word martyr from, but not only did he reveal the truth and bring the truth, and John says he showed up to exegete God to us. So if in the Old Testament, God is I am, then as we go through the gospel of John, I am the good shepherd. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the resurrection that that Jesus fills in for us things about God more than anyone could ever do, and that he was faithful and true, faithful all the way through to laying down his own life and giving us that truth, that Jesus is the faithful witness, that we can trust this. But not only is he the faithful witness, but he goes on to say that he is the firstborn of the dead. I want you to see Jesus' resurrection because this is why we should even be in this room today. If Jesus had not conquered the grave, then let's go play golf. And I don't play golf, right? But let's go to the lake. Let's do something. Because if Jesus didn't conquer the grave, none of the rest of us are going to. But as he sees him, he says, hey, let me tell you who wrote this letter to you. The faithful witness, the guy who was faithful all along giving us truth. It's coming from him. He is also the firstborn from the dead, which means that he is the promise and the pattern of what's coming for us. That we can count on this as he stands there alive, we can know this isn't a dead letter. As he stands there reigning, the firstborn, that is the promise. And why does that matter? Because even if Domitian kills you, I will raise you in the very next moment. You be faithful. The firstborn, firstborn from the dead is writing to you. He is risen. And then, look at this. He 
reigns the ruler of kings on earth. And let's look at that for a moment. Does it say he will one day be the ruler of kings on earth? Does it say he will eventually be the ruler of kings on earth? No, it says that what day is he ruler of kings of earth, church? What day? What day? All right, let's get it up in here. Who rules the kings of earth today? Who rules the kings of earth today? And so this means we don't have to stress, right? I, I, I know that we get fired up about our political, political uh, opportunities. And we should. We have a greater privilege to vote than John ever had. John didn't get a vote for Domitian, I assure you. The churches in Asia didn't get a vote for Domitian. But just because we get the vote doesn't mean that our people reign anymore. Jesus reigns over all of them still. This is the good hope. So it's a word to those churches. Hey, Domitian thinks he's in charge. He's not. Jesus is the ruler of the kings of earth, which means he rules who becomes kings and who does not. He rules over what they do and what they do not do. He reigns over every aspect of this and he will triumph over them. And the best part is in Ephesians, what we're told is that when God raised him from the dead and he set him above every rule and every age and every authority, he says he then gave Jesus to some group. I was trying, what, what group was that that he gave him to? Do y'all remember? Oh, we got to go through the book of Ephesians then. It says he gave him to the church. He reigns for our good. Let that wash over you for just a moment. I don't know if our mayor and governor and president and elected officials always rule for our good. I know that Jesus always rules for our good. That he was given to rule for our good and he is the ruler of all the earth. Now, how is it that grace and peace can come from the Trinity? Right here, he gets to the gospel. Here it is. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood. You, you should just underline and memorize every one of those phrases. Because here is not only Jesus' resurrection and his reign, here is his redemption. The phrase there, he loves us, is written in the present tense. Which means, guess what? Jesus loved you yesterday, Jesus loves you today, and Jesus will love you. See, you're sharp. Good, right? That he continues to love us. It's not a thing where he loved you and doesn't anymore. Jesus continues to love you every day that you are in him. He loves us. But then it says that he's freed us. Now that's written in an aorist tense, which means he committed an action that doesn't have to be repeated, but it carries over for us. So he loves us continually, but he did something for us that has continuous results. And what he did was he freed us. What did he free us from? It says he freed us from our sins because we were chained to them. We are in bondage. You know what we celebrate in that baptistry today is not that water has washed anything away, but that we were chained, all of us, in rebellion because we have all rejected God's reign. We have rebelled and therefore we're in chain to the flesh and the world and the devil. And no matter what we may do, I've been putting some shelves up at our house and I tried to cut through that. I couldn't cut through it, right? I tried a little hacksaw. It wasn't cutting through. And there's nothing with these chains to the flesh and the world. We lack the power to even cut ourselves free, but Christ has freed us, that he has liberated us. The words here, that he has loosed us, that he has set us free. And if we are free, then we are free indeed. And we will always be free. How did he do it? By his blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the uh, and don't you ever forget it there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb he loved you when you didn't deserve to be loved he freed you when no one or anything else could free you and he did so by spilling his blood to cover all of our wretched rebellion. Now the question is, how do we ever stop singing about that? He just writes and he says, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood. But that's not the end of the story, is it? It goes on to say, he's made us something. He's made us a kingdom. He has made us priests to his God and Father. 
So I, w- I want us to think about this just for a moment. The Colossians says he's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to his kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. And he's come in and he, he transfers us from that domain and puts us in the kingdom where he rules over us. But it's not just for us. It will be for, for all nations. Here's the best thing because he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. He doesn't need permission to gain people from every tribe and language and nation. He goes and gets them. He doesn't need a visa to do that. And he doesn't need any ruler's permission to get his people. And so he, he made us a kingdom and priest. So while we celebrate, we've been freed from our sins. Oh, but, but church, you've been freed to serve in the most incredible way. You see, you've been made a part of his kingdom. And that should always reign over every citizenship and loyalty. For me, it goes Jesus, LSU, well... Jesus, family, clarify that, they're on the front row, LSU, and whatever else I'm part of, right? Oh, wait, Hebron, you want to be up there too, okay, Jesus, family, Hebron, then LSU, right? Go Tigers. So, that that all these other loyalties, though, they sometimes rise up to a place they weren't. He's made us a part of his kingdom. We have the opportunity to have the greatest ruler and then to be priests, which means that we should never stop praising, we never stop praying, and we never stop helping others. And the way we do that is by being living sacrifices, as Romans 12 says, that that we, we have laid ourselves on the altar and yet he grants us breath and life. And so every day we're a living sacrifice, offering lips that offer sacrifice of praise. And so you and I have been delivered, but we have been delivered in order to be deployed as priests and a part of his kingdom. The last thing uh, that I want to show you is Jesus' return. And here's what it says in verse 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. We sang that today. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will well on account of him. To which John says, even so, amen. That, that here he is and every eye is going to see. And so I want you to know that this won't be a secret return. This this is not a secret return that he's talking about here. All will see him, even those who pierced him. And that there will be those who wail on account of him, especially those who are not ready and those who've rejected him. That when Jesus returns, there will be some who are not ready. I hope none of those live on your street. I hope none of those are in your family. I hope none of those are at your job. Because Jesus is coming And he will come on the clouds. And it won't be just those of us who gather in here Sunday after Sunday who see him. All will see him, even those who pierced him. And when he returns, he's coming to gather those who eagerly await his return. And then he's coming to give justice to those who have rejected him. But all will see and he will come back. So we need to know. Uh, The worst thing to fear is God's wrath. And if Jesus has taken that, then we don't have to fear whatever else is in Revelation, right? That he will save us, but we must flee to him, which gets us to our concluding action here today. Resolve in the Spirit's power to be a church who responds. Resolve in the Spirit's power to be a church who responds. Look at verse 3. Blessed is one who reads aloud the words. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. That that there should be a response from us. And so we should respond with worship. It's what we saw in in verse 6. As he writes and says, to him be glory and dominion. That that as John thinks about Jesus and he writes about Jesus, he can't help but be moved right into worship. That, That we are eagerly waiting. But there's also wailing. And this is what I... I want to, to, us to be burdened with gospel urgency that, that we want to minimize those who are going to wail when he returns because we have gone to them with the word, right? That we have taken the gospel to them and then our working, our, our reading, our hearing, our keeping. Let me ask you two questions. Are you reading the word? Are you hearing the word? Are you keeping the word? And then who are we helping hear it and who are we helping keep it? Who are you helping hear the word? We, we have languages, tribes, nations who still lack revelation in their language and all the rest of the Bible. Who are we helping to hear the word? And two, who are we helping keep it? We have senior adults that are younger folks. I hope that we're coming along our senior adults to say, keep running, keep running. I hope our senior adults are coming along our teenagers to say, keep running through high school and college. 
keep running. To those young marrieds with kids that are tempted to bail out, keep running. Who are we helping to keep these words and then taking them to the nations? I want you to turn to Revelation 22. Benjamin, the group's going to come. We're going to respond this morning. But as they respond, you're turning to Revelation 22. I want to summarize this way. When we suffer, we tend to be selfish. When we suffer, we tend to want to quit. And we tend to become discouraged. So God has written this word so that if we suffer for his sake, we won't be any of those things. The summary that's in your notes there, that, that God is in control that God will bring all things to his appointed end for them, that God has work for his church to do until then, and he's provided revelation for the purpose of our hopeful and joyful perseverance. And he does so by giving us a, a reminder of his greatness and the go goodness of the gospel. So we should be encouraged and strengthened and hopeful. But here's how I want to close out. It says that he is the Alpha and Omega. In Revelation 22, th this is repeated again. And here's what it says. In, in, I'm sorry, in Revelation 21, I, I led you wrong. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 5. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Same thing that we saw in our text. The beginning and the end. Now watch this. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. God is going to be the end of all things for every person. To some, he will be a fountain of life, and to some, he will be a fountain of wrath. What makes the difference? What makes the difference is the one who's thirsty, who flees to him, who comes to the spring of water of life without payment. Why, why can we come to the spring of life without payment? Because the payment has been made by the one who loved us and freed us from our sin by his blood. All the payment that was needed for you to be free has been paid already. But I wanna pause here because as we think about God being the beginning of all things, and the end of all things, he will be the end of all things for all people in one of two ways. Which will he be for you, church? Will he be the fountain of life because you have fled to Christ? Or will he be a fountain of wrath because you've rejected all this? You don't want to buy in. We want to beg you today, flee to the Alpha and Omega and flee to the lamb who was slain for us. Flee to the lion of the tribe of Judah who conquers and reigns, even crushing our sin and our death. He has taken all our sin upon him. All you must do is to repent and believe and to yield your life to Jesus. So we would beg you, do not be those who their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Be those who are thirsty even now and come to Jesus. And we want to give you that opportunity in the next few moments. Our ministers will be here. You want to know how to come to Jesus. They will walk you through that. We have counselors that are trained to answer your questions. What about the rest of us? If you've yielded your life to Jesus, what do we need to do? Well, I hope that you'll stop being fearful and anxious about the future and you will walk with it in confidence of the Lord. I hope that you will keep sharing his words. You will keep reading them and you will keep making sure that all hear them. And last, I hope this room and this day is not the only day you worship. I hope these words fuel worship every day this week as you go forward. Father, thank you for your word and the chance to have it. Thank you for your revelation that you have unveiled. Please help us to be faithful with it. The picture here that you have given us of the Christ who reigns, and we are called to respond to this. How will we respond? May we be those who recognize our thirst and come to the fountain of life rather than having to experience you as the omega, the end, which is the fountain of wrath that never ends. Either way, you will be the end of all things, but only one of these two, a fountain of life or a fountain of wrath, and Jesus is the answer to what divides that. So, Father, help us flee to him today. 
Thank you for revelation that you've given it for our comfort, to fuel faithfulness, for our hopeful and joyful perseverance. I pray as we study this book that, that we will not worship the revelation, we will worship the one who's given the revelation, that we will worship the one who is worthy, that you will help us to internalize these words so that these words can go forth through us and they can resound back in our prayers and praise to you. So Father, use this study in our lives to forever change us. It's in your name we pray, amen.